In this video, I'm going to build a primitive computer out of individual transistors that can add two 8-bit numbers together. This is a fundamental building block of a CPU's arithmetic unit, which is the part inside a processor that actually does the mathematical computations. To understand how it works, let's first take a look at logic gates. These are the building blocks that make up any kind of logic device, from the most basic integrated circuits to the most advanced CPUs. The AND gate has an output of 1 when both inputs are 1, the OR gate has an output of 1 when either or both inputs are 1, and the XOR, or exclusive OR gate, has an output of 1 when only one of the inputs is 1. If both of them are 1, the output is 0. The NANDs, or negated AND gate, is the opposite of the AND gate, and outputs 1 unless both inputs are 1. The NOR gate is the opposite of the OR gate, and only outputs 1 when both inputs are 0. And the XNOR gate is the opposite of the XOR gate, it will output 1 when either both inputs are 1 or both inputs are 0. The inverter only has one input. If you put in 1, you get out 0, and if you put in 0, you get out 1. All it's doing is flipping one bit. One easy way to remember the negated gates is that they're just regular gates with an inverter connected to the output. That's what this little circle on the symbol represents. In the old days, these gates were built with mechanical relays, but that took up a lot of space and an immense amount of electrical power. If one small relay took 20 milliamps of current at 5 volts, for example, holding one byte of data with all ones would require nearly one watt of power. A kilobyte of data with all ones would pull nearly a thousand watts. If you did this in your house, it wouldn't take long before the computer started blowing circuit breakers. It would be even worse if you tried to do this with vacuum tubes, because the cathode filament alone would consume almost one watt per tube. Plus, having thousands of vacuum tubes operating in the same place might put out enough x-rays to be dangerous. Luckily, transistors are dirt cheap and plentiful, so that's what I'll be using. There's two main types of transistor logic used in computing, TTL and CMOS. TTL stands for Transistor Transistor Logic and uses bipolar junction transistors to build logic gates, and CMOS stands for Complementary MOSFET, which uses a P and N channel MOSFET pair to build logic gates. TTL uses more power and can't fit as many transistors in a given space, but it's a lot more durable, whereas CMOS uses dramatically less power than TTL, and MOSFETs can be built much smaller so that more are crammed into a given space, but it's very easy to damage or destroy them, which is why you always have to observe electrostatic discharge precautions when you handle anything with CMOS chips. Let's take a closer look at TTL. A bipolar junction transistor has two different types, PNP and NPN, which refers to how the P and N type semiconductor materials are layered in it. Incidentally, this semiconductor arrangement is very similar to a regular diode, except it has one extra element. In a PNP transistor, a small current, which we'll call I0, flowing from the emitter to base triggers an even larger current to flow from the emitter to the collector. The emitter to collector current is equal to I0 times the gain factor, HFE. This number can vary widely from one transistor to the next, but most are in the ballpark of 100 to 200. In an NPN transistor, I0 flows from base to emitter and triggers a large current to flow from collector to emitter. In either case, whether you're using a PNP or NPN transistor, holding a logic element at a given state will require some amount of current to flow, which is why TTL is relatively power hungry. You also need more parts than CMOS because each transistor will need resistors to bias it and or limit current. The MOSFETs used for CMOS work a little bit differently. A MOSFET stands for Metal Oxide Semiconductor Field Effect Transistor. This also uses P and N type semiconductor material, but controls current flow with an electric field rather than a little bit of current like a BJT does. Here's an example of an N channel MOSFET. The gate is separated from the P type substrate with a metal oxide electrical insulator, effectively forming a capacitor between the gate and source. When that capacitor is charged up, the electric field causes current to flow across the substrate from drain to source. Unlike the BJT, which was a current amplifier, the MOSFET is a voltage controlled switch. A P-channel MOSFET is arranged in the opposite way, with no charge on the gate, current will be allowed to flow from source to drain, but when a charge is applied and the gate voltage is raised above the drain voltage, the electric field stops the flow of current. If we put a P and N channel MOSFET together, we get a complementary MOSFET pair, or CMOS, which can be used as a logic gate element. Here I've constructed an inverter. When the input is high, the output is low, and vice versa. The important thing about this arrangement is that holding it in a given state requires no current to be consumed. Current is only consumed when changing between states, and this is why CMOS is so much more efficient than TTL. 
Like I mentioned though, there is a downside, which is the fragility of CMOS elements. This is because the gate insulator is extremely thin, usually less than, say, 100 nanometers. It takes very, very little voltage to exceed the dielectric strength of this small strip of material and cause current to flow across it. In a high-density CMOS chip, like in a computer CPU, as little as 7 or 8 volts can overpower the insulation. In the case of a static shock from your finger, the voltage is usually at least a few thousand, and there's sufficient energy that the short-circuit current across the gate insulation will damage or destroy it, rendering the MOSFET completely useless. Hence, CMOS chips have to be handled with extreme care. Personally, I'm pretty clumsy about breaking things, so I'm just going to build my logic gates with TTL for this video. Let's go back to our chart of logic gates, and I'll show how each one is built using NPN transistors. Let's start with the AND gate. When both inputs are zero, the 220K pull-up resistor causes current to flow through the base of the third transistor, causing it to pull the output down to zero. When both inputs are 5 volts, the first two transistors conduct and pull the base voltage on the third transistor down to ground, stopping it from conducting. This allows the 47K resistor to pull the output up to 5 volts. The OR gate is built almost the same way, but in this arrangement the input transistors are parallel, so either one can pull down the base of the output transistor. The XOR gate has a second set of transistors and pull-up resistors, and when either input is 5 volts, the base of the output transistor will be pulled down to 0 volts, causing the 47K resistor to pull the output to 5 volts. However, if both inputs are 5 volts, both sets of pull-down transistors are shut off, causing the base voltage on the output transistor to be pulled to 5 volts by the 220K pull-up resistor, pulling the output down to 0 volts. The negated logic gates are built the same way, except by removing the NPN output transistor, the result is inverted, so these actually require less parts. The simplest logic gate is the inverter, since it just takes a single NPN transistor and pull-up resistor. When there's zero volts on the base, the transistor doesn't conduct, and the 47K resistor pulls the output to 5 volts. And when there's 5 volts on the base, the transistor conducts and pulls the output down to zero volts. Here's a look at these gates in action. I'll start with the AND gate. The inputs are the LEDs on the left, and the output is the LED on the right. Next is the OR gate. And then the NAND, just doing the opposite of the AND gate. And then the NOR, doing the opposite of the OR. And the inverter, which is also called a NOT gate. And here's the XOR gate on its own separate board. So now that we've got a good idea of what logic gates are and how to build them, the question is, how can they be used to do some computing? Well, there's quite literally an infinite number of ways, but for this project, I'm going to use logic gates to build an adder circuit. A single adder takes two bits as inputs, and their sum is an output. The sum can either be 0, 1, or 2. If the sum is 2, the sum bit will output 0, and the carry bit will output 1, signifying that the sum is one order higher than the adder bit. To build on that idea, if the adder receives a carry input from the lower order bit, the sum can be as high as 3, in which case both the sum and carry bits output 1. Here's what the schematic for an adder looks like at the transistor level. I grabbed 19 transistors from my giant stockpile and threw a board together to try it out. The top two red LEDs are the input bits, the bottom red LED is the carry input, the top green LED is the sum bit, and the bottom green LED is the carry output. As you can see, when the two inputs are high, the carry output goes high because the sum is one bit higher than either of the input bits. When all three inputs are high, the sum is equal to 3, which is represented in binary by a 1-1 one, one output. Okay, so the adder circuit works as planned, but adding two or three bits together isn't very exciting. I'd really like to add at least eight bits together. This is accomplished by having one adder for each bit and then chaining them together so that each adder's carry output feeds into the carry input pin of the higher bit's adder. Here's what that looks like at the logic gate level. And it's even scarier at the transistor level. As daunting as this looks, it's actually just the same adder board copied eight times. So after I got the first one working, making duplicates was pretty fast. 
On average, it took me about 30 minutes per board, and once all the boards were assembled, a total of 152 transistors and 224 resistors were used. I assembled the boards into a vertical stack using number 4 thread half inch long hex standoffs, which would give the adder a very clean look when it was finished. The last board in the stack simply connected an LED to each output bit. So that's the brain of the adder complete. Now I needed something to actually put the numbers in. So I built this switchboard that allowed me to input two 8-bit numbers, which is two bytes. I mounted everything to a 3D printed tray to keep it organized wired up all the inputs and outputs, then turned it on. I tested each board individually before assembly and made sure to label every wire, so despite the complexity, it actually worked correctly the first time. Okay, so let's try to add some numbers. Here's 81 plus 29. Sure enough, the output gives the correct answer of 110. Next, I try 131 plus 105. The adder outputs 236. Correct again. Let's try 170 plus 85. And the adder gives us 255. Perfect. Looks like everything is working perfectly. This was my first time doing anything with digital logic, so I was really satisfied with the outcome. In future videos, I'll be adding memory, some sequential logic, and maybe even more complicated computations like multiplication or division. Thanks for watching.